Do you ever face that? Maybe lose track of all the blessings that God has given us. Father God, thank you for all those blessings that we take for granted, that we don't even recognize sometimes as blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you've provided so many things in our lives. And yes, there are challenges. Life is full of challenges, Lord. But you love us. He guide us. And as we open your word today to look at your guidance, to look at how you lead us, to look at how you speak to us, Lord, I just pray that you will speak to us in a special way through this service, that our hearts and minds will be open to your truth, that your Holy Spirit will teach us, and that we will listen. Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, I can, this guy is sitting on the bed, which you saw in the video, at night, but we also saw him getting up in the morning, and I don't know about you, but mornings are a challenge. Are mornings a challenge to you? How many of you are morning people? Not very many. Most of us are not morning people. Most of us, may, we may get up in the morning early, but we're not really morning people. I get up in the morning, I get out of bed, and I stumble to the shower, and as I'm turning on the shower, I'm trying not to fall asleep while I'm waiting for the shower to get warm, etc. But, but that's not really the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge for me in the morning is breakfast. Breakfast is a challenge because I have to make a decision. And, and my, my stomach is really not hungry that early in the morning. But I know I've got a big day, I've got things to do, and in a little while I'm going to get hungry. And so I know I need to eat, but I don't know what to eat. Am I alone in this or do you guys face these similar challenges, right? And so I look and I say, well, I can have cheese and crackers or something. I get, but I don't really want that, you know. Or I can have some cereal. Eh, I don't want some cereal. Eh, you know. Or I can make an egg, but I'm too lazy to make an egg. And so, so this was my dilemma this morning. I'm looking and trying to figure out, and finally, I came up with a solution. I had a corn dog. Now, now a corn dog, you know, breakfast of champions, right? It had the protein, you know, stuff. But it was a decision that I had to make, and then you go on to make other decisions. You make decisions like, you know, what am I going to wear, you know? And you, you stand in front of the mirror. It's not just the girls, by the way. It's the guys, too. The guys struggle over what to wear. It's not just, we, we don't just put something on. You know, we, we go and we look in the mirror, you know, and go, does this, does this make me look like a hunk or a chunk? You know, you, you, you want to make sure that you get the right look, right? I, I'm past the age of impressing girls, by the way. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to look okay. Um, and then, you know, you, you get to work maybe, or you get to school or someplace like that. And then the decision process is all over again. When you get to lunch, right? Okay, pizza or a burger or a taco, what should I get? You know, what are you filled with these decisions all the time. But really, quite frankly, are they that important? Whether I wear a blue sweater today or a black sweater today, does it really matter? No. But some decisions do. Some of the decisions we make in our life really do matter. Decisions of whether or not, should I, now I'm getting close to graduation, should I go for my master's? Should I do OPT? Or I, I'm 
I'm getting to the point where I need to decide on a major in college. What should that be? Or, you know, I, I'm, this, this girl is looking really nice. Should I ask her out? Uh, you think, what does that really matter? But it could very well affect your future, right? And it could affect other people's futures as well. And so these are important decisions. So how do we, how do we come up with it? How do we decide what to do? Well, for breakfast, it's no biggie. But these, it would be helpful, you know, with these far-reaching choices, if we had some guidance. Our memory verse is Job 34.4. And in this, it says, Job is talking, and he says, let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. Now, in context, Job has been struggling with why things have been happening to him. And he's doing a little whining, and he's going back and forth, and he just doesn't get it. But the point he's making here is very interesting. He says, let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. He's not saying, let me just come up with a decision. Let's get together. Let's try to figure out what is right. Let us learn together what is good. He's realizing that it is really good to go to another source. Making a decision about what color of socks to put on is one thing. But for the big decisions, we need wisdom from another source. As Christians, we know our ultimate source of wisdom is God, right? Right. But experiences tell us that hearing God sometimes is not that easy. One of the things I hear from people all the time is like, how do you know if God's talking to you? I've never heard God's voice. So he's never spoken to me audibly. How do I know if it's God? How do I know what God might want me to do? I mean, the question is why? Why doesn't God want to help us know what to do? Yes. But the fact is that silence sometimes occurs. Sometimes God is silent. Is it our sin? Sometimes. Are that it is is it his ways? The way he decides to communicate? Lots of different reasons. In fact, silence can also be a tool to make us desire Him more. Because sometimes when we have something that we take for granted and is taken away from us, we want it even more. We desire it even more. And sometimes silence is like that, the silence of God. When we don't, we don't feel it really close to Him, it's because perhaps He's using that to give us the desire to know Him more. The desire to really seek after his face. But thankfully, even when we're not hearing an audible voice, even when we're not getting what we would say direct revelation from God, God uses other ways to communicate. He shows us how to help make decisions even when the silent times. And one of these methods that he uses or that he shows us is to observe what God is doing. To observe what God is already doing. You know, I do, I have done a fairly good amount of counseling and mentoring. And oftentimes when people will come to me and ask like, what do you think I should do in this situation? Or how should I proceed? Oftentimes we, we pray about it or I ask them to pray about it and I say, well pray, pray this way. I say, pray that God will open the doors that you're supposed to go through and close the doors that you're not supposed to go through. In other words, that God will be showing you what He's already opening. 
And then if the direction is wrong, then it'll close it. And I've had people tell me, you know, oh, that's just way too simplistic. It's worked in my life. It works in my life all the time. To really observe what God is already doing right now. What is He showing you? What is He opening up for you right now? In ministry situations, it can be a matter of closely observing your surroundings. For instance, it could be a matter of, of seeing a need that God is placing on your doorstep. Uh, we live right now, our church is surrounded by uh, right across the street, we have a school that we have a lot of Hispanics. We have a lot of, of children of other ethnic origins. And with, with this Hispanic population that is growing around here, etc., there's a need there. So what are we doing about it? God has obviously opened a door. What would happen if God began to bring into our congregation people who were also very gifted in Spanish. Could it be that God was wanting something to be done? Could this be a way that we could see that God is showing us direction in ministry? Sometimes that's the way it works. And it can also be about the fruit we're already seeing He's bringing. When we were in Africa, uh, this last time when we were in Senegal, there, the dominant people group is the Wolof people. And the Wolof people are extremely, extremely resistant to the gospel. But they have another group there, um, there's many other groups, but another group there that's called the Serer. And the Serer have become more and more open to the gospel. Now some people, it's like, well, we need to just reach the Wolof. Reach the Wolof. And I agree, the Wolof need to be reached. But a lot of the missionaries are beginning to look at it and go, you know what? The Serer are open. So let's reach the Serer. Let's go to the Serer villages. Let's talk to them because they're the ones that God seems to be opening the door to. Let's not ignore them and say, oh, I'm here only for the Wolof. Instead, let's try to reach the Serer for Christ. And as they've been doing that, we're seeing more and more Serer come. When I went to Senegal, I was there specifically to do one task and there were others that were there, that were doing, that were working with the locals. But I really felt led to work with internationals. And the internationals were the ones who were coming to Christ. The internationals were the ones who were really beginning to see the vision, beginning to really respond. Should I have said no to the internationals? Well, wait a minute, I need to go only focus on this group. No. Because that's not what God was doing. We can't make our decisions based on our preconceptions or presuppositions. We need to see what God is doing, the fruit He's bringing in, what, what He's doing in our surroundings. Last week, we were looking at Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas, the, the whole situation... Is there an Antioch? And these, there are some people come from Jerusalem. They come up from the Jerusalem church and they begin to tell them, they say, look, you Gentiles, you cannot be saved just by believing in Jesus. You can't be saved that way. You also have to be circumcised. Well, this got into a big discussion, right? And a big dispute. And so the church sent Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem to basically talk about it and get that counsel. And so they begin to, to talk about this whole issue, right? They've come to seek God's will in this, see what God is doing. And we pick up the story in Acts 15, 12. It says, The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. I like this. They, the whole assembly became silent. They're really listening to what's going on here. These, these assemblies could sometimes be a little bit rock. It's sort of like the British Parliament, where everybody's talking at once, etc. But when Barnabas and Paul began to talk and explain what was going on among the Gentiles, everybody felt quiet. They wanted to hear this. 
They wanted to see exactly what God had already been doing. When stuck over a decision, we need to look at what God has already been doing. When you're stuck, look at God, what God is already doing in your life. I told you before that when we came back here, I had to take some continuing education classes. And back in 2008, 2009, we came back. And originally, I was going to take some history classes at UCO. And instead, God very specifically told me to take Chinese. I was like, okay, fine, whatever. So I took some Chinese classes. But then, after I was taking the Chinese classes in 2010, I heard of a Chinese group that had begun to meet and that some people were getting saved. There was a Chinese Bible study. And I thought, okay, this is what God is doing. God has opened the door for me to take Chinese. So maybe I should start attending this Bible study. And so I did. And as things worked out, eventually I became the leader of that study. And you may not know this, but our Tuesday night Bible study did not start at this church. It is a direct continuation of that Asian Bible study that I began to teach back in 2010. It just got brought over here. God has a mysterious way of working sometimes. But it was a matter of looking what God was doing. Looking what God was, how God was working. And then it became clear. So if the direction begins, begins after you're observing what God is doing and your direction is beginning to seem clear, the second step, determine if what you are thinking is biblical. Determine if what you are thinking is biblical. You and I are experts at rationalizing, aren't we? We can rationalize anything. Anything we want. You know, you can could, you could maybe not really be hungry, but there's ice cream in the refrigerator, in the freezer, right? And you can convince yourself, oh, ice cream's really good for me. I need the dairy. I really need the dairy. But I'm not hungry, and it'll make me get fatter. But I need the dairy. It's really good for me. And calcium builds strong bones. You're laughing, but I know you do the same thing, right? No? no? Uh -huh, yes. You do the same thing. We rationalize. But, you know, you can rationalize anything. You can rationalize cheating on your wife. You can say, well, God wants me to be happy. <laughs> And I'm a, I'm a lot happier with this person than I am with my wife right now. And, you know, he wants us to be equally yoked. And, and she really seems to really get me. So I, I really want to be with this person. And I better not tell my wife about it because that would just make her upset. And I'm really supposed to have harmony within the family. See what you're doing you're justifying sin. You're rationalizing it away. We can rationalize all we want, but we need to really determine whether what we're thinking is rationalization or what's really biblical. And a solid test is any decision that you're making, a critical decision, is it backed up by the Bible? Is it backed, is backed up by what the Bible is teaching? In our story, look at Acts 15, 13 through 18. It says, when they finished, when Paul and Barnabas finished talking, James spoke up and he says, brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. 
After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. Things known from long ago. So he's looking at Scripture. He's going to end, and there are lots of Scriptures in the Bible that talk about the Gentiles coming to Christ. He's taking a rather obscure one from Amos. But he's taking that and he's saying, look, Scripture backs up what we're talking about. Now, obviously, obviously, you can make Scripture say anything you want to. You can twist it and turn it and try to come up with it, you know, to, to come up with a solution for whatever you want to do. And you shouldn't use the Bible like some kind of, I don't know, magic eight ball. You know what a magic eight ball is? came out in the 1950s, yeah, some of you have seen it. 1950s, a magic eight ball. Now, we good Christian kids never use this. But let's say hypothetically, a misguided child picked up one of these magic eight balls and looked at it and it's like, okay, magic eight ball, uh, should I buy a new sound system? And, and the answer that came up would be something like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, my reply must be no. Well, that can't be right. So magic eight ball, should I really uh, get a new sound system? Turn back over and the answer pops up something like, you know, I can't answer that at this time. You know. Magic 8-Ball, should I get a new sound system? Yep. Hey, see, it works. We can do the same thing with the Bible. We can take it and we can flip through it and it's a, okay, Lord, I'm really struggling. What should I do with my career? Uh, uh, oh, Delilah is having people come shave Samson. I need to be a beautician or a barber. <laughs> Some way the Bible works. You're probably not going to find a specific verse, let's say, about changing your major from account to accounting for marketing. Probably not. But you will find guidance in the Bible's teachings for all of your decisions as God is prompting you into certain areas. Back in 1970, a guy by the name of Larry Ward had a dream from God. He dreamed that he saw 12,000, why are the number? I don't know, but 12,000, 12,000 people who were starving to death. And they were looking directly at him. And he just felt this burden like, oh, what can I do? And he woke up and, and he just responded to God, well, God, here am I, send me. Now, it wasn't that Larry had never not been doing anything. He used to be the editor for uh, Christianity Today. He was currently working at World Vision. He was very involved with this kind of stuff. But God was obviously speaking to him. Obviously talking to him and giving him a direction. He was trying to figure out exactly what that was. So he felt led to resign from World Vision. And he's on a plane with his son, Kevin, who's 12 years old. And God brings to mind Scripture. Psalms 146.7 where it says, He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. And that verse just spoke to me. And so in 1971, Larry Ward established what would become an international organization and mission called Food for the Hungry, which has reached out to, I don't know, how many millions of people. But see, God was leading. God had been doing something in Larry's life. God was showing him something. And then he brought to mind Scripture that confirmed that leading, that movement. And showed him a kind of a refinement, a redirection on it of where he needed to go. Scripture can be used that way to guide us. 
and to show us and confirm that we're on the right path, or show us that we're in the wrong path as well. But in addition to observing what God is already doing and checking with Scripture, checking to make sure that you are on the right path, it's also helpful to seek the counsel of godly leaders and friends. To seek the counsel of godly leaders and friends. And my Bible makes it very clear, we're not in this alone. You and I are not some lone wolves out there with Christianity. We have a body. And a body is there to help us, to encourage us, to provide for us in the ways. And God gives us leaders, godly leaders, there to also help us make decisions, to help us, to encourage us and to guide us and to show us maybe what God is doing. And we see this play out in Acts 15, 19 through 22. Okay, so James, speaking, he says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times. It is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. Who is James, by the way? Do you remember? Right. The half-brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem church, or one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, also the author of the book of James. James is speaking, some people say that it wasn't in this, the wording here is, in my judgment, it's more of like in my opinion. In other words, he's not just saying, making a unilateral decision. He's still with the elders, and they're still making this decision together as they've heard this counsel, etc. But they're leaders who God has put into place to help answer this question in the church. And God puts people in leadership roles for a very specific reason. Our decision to go to synagogue, we, we were in a situation where we didn't know exactly where God wanted us. We had three offers on the table. We had Japan, we had Ivory Coast, and we had Senegal. All three had expressed interest in either staying like we were in Japan or going to these other countries. We just didn't know. We felt that we were supposed to go back to West Africa. And then God used a godly man by the name of Dick Jacobs. And Dick Jacobs said, you know, looking, looking at where you are, looking at who you are, I really feel God could use you more than Senegal. So we took that advice. And we went to Senegal and God greatly blessed it. But it was something that we needed that leader. We needed that leader to come alongside us and say, ultimately, yeah, you have to decide. But this is what I feel God is saying. God may also use family or friends to do this. Uh, when I went to Senegal, I never even crossed my mind to get involved with refugee work. And then I had a friend named B.J. Bentley, Canadian guy. And he said, hey, would you help me out with something? Would you be on the board of this ministry to refugees? And I was like, well, I don't know. I, don't, I got busy. You know, they said, come on, etc. And so I agreed to get involved. Pretty soon I'm the leader of the organization. And God used it my way. But it was something that a friend of mine had to come alongside and kind of get me into that direction. James is listening to what God has been doing. He confirmed his decision with Scripture. 
and then he gives counsel. But there's a vital part of this process that wasn't mentioned, but was definitely done. And this was to pray, listen, and rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance. Pray, listen, and rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance. You know, we can say that's first and foremost. That's right at the top. We can see what God is doing. We can confirm our thinking with Scripture. We can seek godly advice. But our ultimate source of wisdom and guidance must still be God. But did James and the church leaders seek God's wisdom? Well, let's look at the letter sent in Acts 15, 23-29. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agree to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Very well. Now, go back to verse 28. Did you catch this? It seemed good to who? The Holy Spirit. And to us. Obviously, they're not just making this decision. They've been consulting. They've been asking the Holy Spirit, what should we do? What is your move? And the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And because of that, they agreed. They said, this is what should be done. We should never make a move, any important decision, ever, without seeking God's guidance. Without seeking what God wants to do. Or wants us to do. If we do, we're just acting foolish. God's ways are higher than ours. God's knowledge is higher than ours. God's plans are perfect for us. I've talked before about Mary Gee, who wrote a very small book that is amazingly become very popular among people. It's called God Guides. And she recalls as a missionary sitting and listening to what? Learning, basically, to listen to God. And through 52 stories that she shares in this little book that is, you know, you can buy it from Amazon, but only use copies, etc. It's kind of hard to find. But um, she talks about all of the ways that she sat and she listened to God speak and how God directed her, God guided her through this. And at one time she was having a struggle. She had a, a lady, another colleague or another person involved in ministry that she was having a problem with and they they'd had this breach in the relationship. She didn't know how to solve it. And so she sat and she asked God, what should I do? How can I breach this relationship? I mean, fix this relationship. And God told her something weird. He said, take her an egg. Take her an egg? Well, I, I surely couldn't have heard that right word. No, take her an egg. So Mary got an egg, went to her friend, gave her an egg. What she didn't know is that that lady had been struggling that day to try to figure, she needed an egg for, to be able to feed her family for whatever she was using. And they were in India and it was not easy to get eggs, I guess. And Mary provided her with an egg. And what that said to this lady was, A, 
Mary's trying to repair our relationship and B, more importantly, that she came up with an A, God wants us to repair our relationship. And so the relationship is restored through an A. Sometimes when God speaks to us, it doesn't really make sense to us. But we really need to listen to his lead. Because what he tells us is always going to be right. So my question for us today is this. Are you experiencing God's lead? Has God been maybe speaking to you about something? Maybe putting something on your heart? And you really don't know if that's the direction you need to go? And it could be about, I don't know anything. It could be about schooling. It could be about a career. It could be that God is asking you to get involved in some sort of service in this church. And you're just not sure. The only thing to find out is to really seek God's face. And if He is being silent for whatever reason, then maybe this model that we've talked about is is a way that you can find that out. To observe what God is doing. Determine if what you're thinking is biblical. To seek the counsel of godly friends and leaders. And most importantly, pray and listen and rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance. Ultimately, you may have to wait a while. Mary Geek had to. But if we seek His will and we listen to Him, he will guide us on the way. We just have to trust Him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You that You want us to know Your will. And You use different ways. But ultimately, You want us to find You and know You and know Your purpose for our lives. So Lord, I ask that you help us to rely on you, not to just make decisions when they're important decisions, randomly, not to use your word as some kind of magic device, not to rely on our own thinking or rationalizations for it, but instead really seek you really seek to know what you would have for us. God, may we follow you completely. In Christ. Amen. Perhaps God, perhaps God is speaking to you today about giving. So now we have an